Ladies and gentlemen, the Knopf Doubleday Publishing Group is pleased to welcome you to an evening with Dan Brown, live from Avery Fisher Hall at Lincoln Center. Please take a moment now to silence your cell phones and other electronic devices, and we ask that you remain at your seat for the duration of tonight's presentation. And now, here to introduce Dan Brown, please join in welcoming a very special guest, co-anchor of NBC's Today Show, Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer. I think this is as loud as it gets, so if you can't hear too well, you can move. It's all right. Thank you very much. Good evening. Welcome to Lincoln Center. Welcome to an evening with Dan Brown. Ho hum. Another launch of another Dan Brown book. I hope you understand that when most people sit down to write a book, they toil away for years. And when they're finished, if they're lucky enough to have that book published, then they just hope someone sits up and takes notice. Someone pays them attention. If in, during the launch, they get one of those tables at a bookstore, whether it's here in New York or some other city <coughs> around the country, then they hope a couple of dozen people line up and maybe ask them to sign their book or maybe talk about it for a couple of minutes. And then there's Dan Brown. And 2,000 people pile into Avery Fisher Hall at Lincoln Center to hear from the master storyteller himself. That is what Dan Brown brings to the world of publishing. Now, I'll be honest with you, when he asked me to introduce him here tonight, I wasn't exactly sure why. I didn't know what the connection was. But then as I got more into the book and learned more about it, about Inferno and about Dante, and I remembered that epic poem from the 14th century, the Divine Comedy, and Dante's journey through the Inferno and through the nine circles of hell, and then it dawned on me. The nine circles of hell, or as I call them, morning television. Don't even get me started about the purgatory part. <laughs> Generally speaking, when I speak to an audience like this, I, my rule is don't bore people with numbers. But I think when it comes to Dan Brown and the phenomenon that is Dan Brown, numbers really do put things into perspective. So bear with me. Dan Brown has in print right now over 200 million copies of his books worldwide. They have been, yeah. Those books have been published in more than 50 languages. The Da Vinci Code, well, he sold more than 81 million copies of that book alone. In 2009, when the lost symbol went on sale, it broke records. Why? Because it sold 1 million copies on the first day. Every book Dan Brown has ever written has become an international bestseller. And then there are the movies based on his story. The Da Vinci Code at the box office, $750 million. Angels and Demons, almost $500 million. This guy has the Midas touch. And he's a guy who, in a, in a strange way, kind of lives the life he writes about. When he invited me up to New England to his home recently to do an interview with him, he didn't just give me the address and the directions like normal people would. He sent it to me in code. <laughs> true. I left New York on a Thursday. I pulled into his driveway the next Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> he can be a real pain in the butt. And apparently I'm no Robert Langdon. So I thought it might be fun to start this evening, if you'll bear with us for five minutes, to show you a portion of the interview we did at his home in New England. And so you get a sense of how Dan Brown does what he does. Take a look. So grim, it's so terrifying. Dante's Inferno is a descent into hell. Nine circles filled with sinners facing demons, grotesque monsters, Satan, and a whole lot of pain. This 14th century classic is a perfect fit for one of the 21st century's most successful authors. So Langdon's back. He's cracking codes, he's going through museums, he's checking out masterpieces. He's getting chased a lot. He, he has that tendency. Sometimes I don't even know who's chasing him after a while. <laughs> and why do you like that so much? Why do you love the action of this intellectual guy, this thinker, who's also running for his life half the time? Well, as, as Dante does so well in Inferno, moving down to the levels, I love to use action to propel plot. With Inferno, Robert Langdon returns to familiar territory. Back once again in Italy, this time in Florence 
solving mysterious clues found in great works of art from the Renaissance, trying to stop an evil villain who threatens mankind. Dan, the villain in this book is a transhumanist. Now, I'll be honest with you, I Googled it, all right? But, <laughs> but, but for people who haven't, what is a transhumanist? Okay, well, transhumanism is the ethics and science of using things like biological and genetic engineering to transform our bodies and make us a more powerful species. Brown says it is a controversial science he's been interested in for years. And not shying away from further controversy, Brown's villain also fears a growing world population. In the last 85 years, our population has tripled, and we add 200,000 new people every day. Are you telling me these things simply as a great thriller writer who's trying to add an element of reality and science? Or are you telling me these things as a guy who's personally concerned about them? Uh, we should all be personally concerned. And in this novel, uh, the, the villain is concerned about this, and he's also a Dante fanatic. And some of his visions of the future parallel Dante's visions of hell. The author spent two years researching Inferno, taking many trips to Florence, an ancient city known for its culture of secrets. When we came up the stairs, we came around this way, can we also get out this way? One group of tourists ran into an unexpected visitor. They were all just standing there in the map room, looking at a map of Armenia, when all of a sudden the map opens, spins, <laughs> and, and I come stepping out of a secret passageway. And these people said, I can't believe it. I'm in the Palazzo Vecchio, and Dan Brown steps out of the wall. And then you had to get the question, just, what does this have to do with your next novel? Absolutely nothing. Nothing to see here. I'm just a tourist. I'm not writing about the mass party. <laughs> On one trip, Brown slips unnoticed into Dante's church. Legend has it that Beatrix is buried there. She was Dante's <laughs> muse and unrequited love. It is tradition to leave letters at her tomb, seeking help with romance. My unrequited love uh, was really to, to write this novel. And I did write a note, uh, singing me muse and through me tell a story of a man versed in symbols. I immediately recognized the quote from Homer. Oh, you are yeah. right, man. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. What does it mean? Uh, it's a petition in the same way that Homer was saying, listen, I've got to write the Odyssey. Sing in me muse and help me tell this story. I wrote a very similar note and put it in there, and uh, a year and a half later, I wrote So who knows? Maybe it's magic. When Brown returns home, it's to a place a lot like his novels. We get a rare glimpse into the colorful <laughs> private world of Dan Brown. His New Hampshire home was built with secret doors and passageways at every turn. You will find me behind this painting. How do you get behind the painting? It's very complicated. You have to come over here, press right here. And so it's a, it's a Dan Brown secret it's passageway. It's a secret passageway at 7 a.m. when I'm working. I will choose to work in here. Brown calls his library the Fortress of Gratitude. It holds his books in more than 50 languages, as well as a few secrets. What is your architect thing? When you started, you're crazy. And I need about four or five What's secret right? passages. There are four too. more in this room. And this one goes there. outside. Here, I'll show you. All right. uh, this is great. Every day when he finishes writing, Brown plays the piano. I stop and I play whatever. I play, just improvise something. Um, That's not chopsticks. That's pretty no. good. Is, is this one of your other passions? This is definitely one of my other passions. As passionate about masterpieces of music as he is about literature and art, and now this master of thrillers releases his sixth novel. He says he has ideas for at least a dozen more. How far along are you on the next one? I am nowhere on the next one. I'm really? exhausted. I just spent three years in hell, as they say. <laughs> and literally, and literally in hell. Me. And, uh, and I'm exhaling a little bit. I can, of course, this is apparently how I exhale. So that was on videotape. Let's bring him out live. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dan Brown.
Thank you, Matt. That was a very generous introduction, made more generous by the fact that he's got to be up in like three hours to be back on the news. So uh, thanks for being here. We're all here tonight, thanks to my publisher, Doubleday Books, the host of this event. I should warn you, I know there's a lot of them in the audience. They are very tired right now. Uh, it has been quite a month gearing up for the publication of Inferno. And tomorrow morning, I'm, I'm sending you all to a spa, I promise. I want to start with a special thank you to my legendary publisher, Sonny Mehta. Uh, also to Tony Chirico, to Bill Thomas, as well as an enormous army of copy editors, proofreaders, fact checkers, book designers, uh, a big production staff, terrific jacket artist, printers, publicists, and of course, Random House's legendary sales force. Um, thank you for all you do. Uh, and also, I would definitely like to give a special salute to Random House's fearless CEO, Marcus Dola, who has just flown in from Istanbul, uh, possibly on his own power. I'm not sure where he is, but uh, we have in the audience tonight a world-famous editor, uh, my dear friend Jason Kaufman. And I say world-famous because he always makes a cameo in my books as, a, uh, as, as Robert Langdon's editor, Jonas Falkman, which is a not very cryptic anagram of Jason Kaufman. Jason is the one who brought me to Doubleday. He and I have worked in the trenches on five books now, including spending the last three years in hell. Uh, Jason, we are finally out of the depths and into the light, so cheers to you. Thank you. There is a wonderful woman here tonight with whom I do daily battle. Doubleday's Senior Vice President of Publishing, Suzanne Hers. Suzanne is constantly trying to put me on TV or in magazines or on the stage, and I am constantly reminding her that the press refers to me as a reclusive author. And uh, there's really no reason to change that, but she's very good at what she does, and every now, you know, now and then she will, uh, she will talk me into you know, things like this. So, uh, Suzanne, uh, you win this round. Um, We also have in the audience this evening the revered Cardinal Mortati. So thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, don't worry, he's a, he's a Cardinal from the Da Vinci Code movie, not from the Vatican. <laughs> also lurking in this room is a highly trained agent who just spent two weeks literally underground in a bunker in Milan with armed guards overseeing a top secret translation operation. My literary agent, Heidi Lang, is one of the finest and hardest working in the business. Heidi, welcome back from Deep Cover. The book is out, translated, no leaks, mission accomplished. Tonight is the first event on an extended book tour on which I'm about to embark, and it also marks a slight deviation from my norm. Uh, in the past, I've always kicked off every book tour at my hometown independent bookstore, the Water Street Bookstore in Exeter, New Hampshire. Water Street's bookseller, Dan Chartrand, yes. <laughs> uh, Water Street's bookseller, Dan Chartrand, was hand-selling hand my books before anybody was reading them. And I mean, I mean nobody was reading them. We sold these out of the back of his car because my car didn't work. Um, he is still at Water Street Bookstore. He is still hand selling to his customers. And tonight, thanks to the miracle of live streaming, I can be two places at once. So to Dan Chartrand and all of you packed into Water Street Bookstore, I may not be with you in the flesh, but I am there with you in spirit as you have always been for me. So thank you for tuning in. And finally, before we get started, I want to welcome two very special celebrity guests in the audience tonight. You know, truth be told, I'm kind of nervous that they're here. Uh, some of you may have seen them come in, and I recognize them, and I, I hope you didn't hassle them. With us tonight are my two favorite authors in the whole world. One has written over a dozen internationally best-selling textbooks. The other is the author of two fascinating histories, as well as being a master scholar of sacred music. Ladies and gentlemen, in the sixth row, my mom and dad.
This week is my mom's 75th birthday, so happy birthday, mom. When I was five years old, my mom helped me write and publish my first book. I dictated, she transcribed, we did a print run of one, with a, you gotta start somewhere, uh, with a cardboard cover and a two-hole punch binding, and mom, I still have it. Here it is, right here. I titled this thriller, The Giraffe, the pig, and the pants on fire. <laughs> uh, as the title suggests, it's a blend of Orwellian allegory and the surrealism of Borges. Um, for the next half hour, I just thought I would do a dramatic reading. So I will not subject you to a reading tonight. But on the day that I published The Giraffe, the Pig, and the Pants on Fire, I was hooked. I had become a writer. Uh, I wrote nonstop in elementary school, high school, and later in college. I feel very fortunate to be able to continue writing later in life. A bit to my surprise, however, some of the books I've written have sparked some rather odd reactions from people. Almost daily, some stranger will come up to me and ask, what happened to you as a child? <laughs> Did some priest drop you on your head at your baptism? Did God not answer some childhood prayer? Now, I hate to admit it in mixed company, but my rather rattled state when it comes to religion can be traced really to only one source, and that would be my parents, clearly. <laughs> uh, normally, I don't begin a talk by pulling skeletons out of the family closet uh, or beating up on my mom and dad, but you know, it, tonight's special. Happy birthday, mom. That's uh, <laughs> exactly what I'm about to do. As many of you know, I've written a lot about the battle between science and religion. Since the days of Galileo and the Inquisition, science and religion have both vied to be that infallible source from which we draw our truth. Nowadays, some of us find our miracles in the pages of Holy Scripture, and some of us find our miracles in the pages of Scientific American. Unfortunately, I grew up the son of a church organist and a math teacher. Uh, I was pretty confused from day one. When I was a child, my mother was not only the church organist, she was the choir director at the church, which meant there was no escaping Sunday morning church services. I didn't mind. I liked the people. I liked the music. Uh, I really liked the free donuts. Uh, but as a kid, all those hours in the house of God really had a power, powerful effect on me. Church is very potent stuff for a kid. There are thundering pipe organs, the smell of incense, the tolling of bells, the magic of a candlelight Christmas pageant. Not to mention, in my case, watching my own mother conducting a huge con congregation as they sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Onward, Christian soldiers. And this reassuring and joyful world became my reality as a child. It never dawned on me to, to question any of it. Not the virgin birth or Noah's Ark, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, the resurrection. It was all fact. Uh, it had to be, because all the adults in the room believed it, including my own mom. Uh, I should add here that my mother was not at all shy about her Christianity. For years as I grew up, she drove me to school and soccer practice in a bright red turbo Volvo station wagon with a license plate in Latin. And I have that license plate tonight. Here it is. For those of you who can't see it, this says Kyrie. Uh, I only wish I'd been president of the Department of Motor Vehicles when my mom explained to the puzzled attendants that she had selected Kyrie because it was a Latin transliteration for the vocative case of the Greek word for Lord, and it was the most common word in the Byzantine Rite Christian liturgy. <laughs> so my mom, with her deep sense of religion, her Kyrie license plate, and her uncanny resemblance to a popular Saturday Night Live character, my mom became affectionately known as the church lady. <laughs> and let me assure you, the power of the church lady was something to behold. In the summers when my siblings and I were not attending church camp, the Brown family lived in a little summer cabin in the White Mountains on a very quiet lake. My mom had this great idea that rather than going to the local church up there, we would have our own little family services and use as our church God's house, the beautiful woodland setting all around us. So on Sunday mornings, my parents, my sister, my baby brother, and I would get in a pair of canoes 
and we would paddle to a deserted spot on the lake, tie the boats together, and we would just float. We would read scriptures, sing hymns, and give thanks to God for the blessings bestowed upon us. Admittedly, a pretty nice idea. The problem was I was 10 years old. Uh, these family services were excruciatingly boring. There was no pipe organ, no choir, and above all, no donuts. Uh, when I complained to the church lady about the lack of donuts, she brought along little baggies of homemade granola. Uh, I am not, I'm not kidding. Early one Sunday morning, dreading what to come, I lay in bed and I prayed to God. And I asked God how to make these unbearable floating services less boring. And God spoke to me. He said, bring a fishing rod. <laughs> now, this seemed perfectly logical. Okay? I, it's not like I was going to cast in the middle of the Lord's Prayer. I was going to just troll a little bit during the readings. Perfectly <laughs> respectful. Uh, my mom, however, felt it was disrespectful to God for me to fish during church. I cleverly argued that if God didn't want me to fish, he would not have made fish so delicious. Uh, I lost that battle. My mom ended the argument by telling me there was no fishing on Sunday because Sunday was a day of rest. I later got the last word by invoking the day of rest argument and boycotting paddling all the way home. So, there's a snapshot of growing up with a church lady. Concurrent with my mother's religious influence, I had my dad who was equally attentive and enthusiastic about his passions and beliefs, which were much more scientific in nature. My father, a math teacher as well as a math textbook author, also revered the beauty and majesty of the world around him, but he tended to see it through a much different lens. When I was a kid, he would take me out at night, we'd look up at the billions of stars in heaven, and we'd talk about space, the universe, and the concept of infinity. Now, infinity, we agreed, was impossible to imagine. And yet, if the universe were not infinite, then what did the edge of the universe look like? A big brick wall in space? A sign saying nothing beyond this point? Uh, these were the thoughts that kept me up awake, uh, kept me awake at night when I was a, a little kid. Whenever there was a lunar eclipse, my dad would prep me for it by pulling out a soccer ball, a tennis ball, and a flashlight. Uh, anybody else do that? <laughs> uh, he would reenact the earth moving between the sun and the moon, casting a shadow. And then there was math. Everywhere there was math. At dinner time, baby carrots were an opportunity to teach about conic sections. We learned that depending on how you cut your carrot, you could create a cross section that was a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, or if you were really good with your knife, the holy grail of all dinner time carrot cuts, the hyperbola. I think I only accomplished that once. My parents did not permit junk food, and we didn't go out for pizza very often, but when we did, my dad would gather us around the big pizza pie, and that's pie, P-I, <laughs> and he would teach us about the degrees of arc, diameters, and areas of circles. And I cannot tell you how mortifying it was to stand in line at Romeo's Pizza with my father and his brand new, t oh. <laughs> Romeo, he's here tonight. So my dad's standing in line with his brand new Texas Instruments calculator. I don't know if you remember these. You know, they were like this big. <laughs> and uh, he carefully calculated whether it was more cost effective to buy a large pizza, two smalls, maybe a small and a medium, freeze the leftovers. Uh, this is the same guy who wrote the international best-selling textbook, Advanced Mathematics. So. By the way, my father's license plate when I was growing up, I have that one too. Here it is. Metric. I am not making this up. My dad was a big proponent of the metric system, and every time he had to deal with inches, ounces, and miles, and their awkward units of 12, 16, 5,280, he'd get angry and he would shout, The rest of the civilized world uses measurements based on 10. What is wrong with us? Uh, People often ask me if my strange upbringing made me a writer, or whether maybe I was just born that way. Uh, statistically, I think it is highly unlikely that my parents would have had three children, all of whom coincidentally had a genetic predisposition toward the creative arts. Nonetheless, I am a writer, my sister is a painter, 
and my brother is a musician. Our shared passion for creativity, I believe, has little to do with our DNA and much to do with our upbringing in a household that had no television, a lot of books, and parents who were professional writers and musicians as well as being teachers. I should add here that my dear mother, the church lady, has had to endure three highly passionate, stubborn, and emotional children, which of course everyone politely referred to as free spirits. Um, while my siblings and I are finally no longer starving artists, we have ad we've admittedly caused my mom some awkward moments with her religious friends. Uh, for my part, I no longer need to ask for help paying my rent, but my mother has had to listen to her church friends whispering behind my back, what do you think she did to that boy to make him write such sacrilegious novels? <laughs> Adding insult to, uh, to injury, my brother Gregory, who is a composer, was recently in the news with the release of his latest work entitled The Misa Charles Darwin. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you get it. It is, as the name might imply, a mass, a composition written using the form of the Catholic liturgy. However, in Gregory's mass, the choir does not sing the traditional Kyrie, Gloria, and Credo. They sing the writings of Charles Darwin. So Greg, uh, when the Vatican comes banging on your door, I don't know you. <laughs> so to all you parents of young children out there tonight, uh, if you're not afraid to support your kids financially forever, encourage them to be creative. Uh, you will either have happy kids whose rent you pay for the rest of your life, or you'll get invited to Lincoln Center and your kids will make fun of you. So you know, either way. So anyway, when I was a kid, in our garage, there was a red Volvo station wagon with the license plate Kyrie, parked beside a white minivan with the license plate Metric. Uh, I saw this as the age-old battle between science and religion squaring off right there next to my little blue Schwinn. Despite this Kyrie Metric conflict and my slightly paradoxical upbringing, I was quite happy in these two worlds of science and religion. But once I matured to the all-knowing age of 13, I started to realize that these two different worldviews posed all kinds of contradictions. The Bible said God created the universe in seven days. But in school, I just learned about the Big Bang. The Bible said God made Adam and Eve and all the animals. But I had just gone to the Boston Museum of Science and seen fossils and heard how everything evolved. And so I asked a priest how I should reconcile these inconsistencies. Essentially, I asked this priest, which story is true? And this particular priest replied by saying, nice boys don't ask that question. <laughs> so I was pretty annoyed uh, and confused, uncertain which way to turn, um, where science offered exciting proof of its claims, photos, equations, visible evidence. Religion was much more demanding. It wanted me to accept everything on faith. And faith, I found, was a pretty difficult proposition in an imperfect world. So in high school and college, I gravitated into the solid foundations of science. But over the years, as my studies in science continued, I discovered that the further one progressed into this solid world of science, the mushier the ground started to get. I'm sure those of you who study a lot of science have had this experience. When science starts tackling the tough questions, it starts using phrases like uncertainty principle, margin for error, theory of relativity. Slowly, physics turns into metaphysics. Numbers become imaginary numbers. And even matter itself comes into question. And I should, I should add that physicists of the subatomic uh, realm now believe that matter is really nothing but trapped energy, that this podium is really nothing but energy trapped in the form of a podium, that each one of us in this room is pure energy manifesting itself in the shape of a human being. I will add that these same physicists who proclaim that everything around us is energy quietly ask if it is merely coincidence that the vast majority of ancient religious texts, including the Bible, describe God as energy and describe God as being all around us. We live in a very exciting era. Right now, for the first time in history, the line between science and religion is starting to blur. 
physicists exploring the subatomic level are suddenly witnessing an interconnectivity of all things, and they are having religious experiences. Buddhist monks are reading physics books and learning about the experiments that confirm what they have believed in their hearts for centuries, but have been unable to quantify. What I finally come to accept is that science and religion are partners. They are simply two different languages attempting to, sell, to tell the same story. Both are manifestations of man's quest to understand the divine. While science dwells on the answers, religion savors the questions. Thousands of years ago, mankind had a huge pantheon of gods and goddesses to explain just about everything that was beyond our understanding. Earthquakes, infertility, thunder, even love. The ebb and flow of the oceans was attributed to the shifting moods of Poseidon. Infertility was caused by falling out of favor with the goddess Juno. Pandemic disease was a punishment, a plague sent by an angry god. This kind of spirituality is known as the god of the gaps. That is, when the ancients experienced gaps in their understanding of the world around them, they filled those gaps with God. Over time, however, the progress of science began removing the gaps. The pantheon of gods started to shrink. For example, we now understand the science of thunder and lightning, and Thor has been banished uh, as a false god of a, of a foolish time. We no longer turn to God for answers as to why the skies drop hail or why plagues spread. Science has answered those questions. We turn to God for the answers to a handful of questions that science has never been able to answer. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And what happens when we die? And in asking those questions, we realize that we, like our ancient ancestors, still worship the God of the gaps. We still call upon God to fill the gaps in our understanding of the human experience. Every day we have a greater scientific understanding of the world around us, and it becomes more difficult to accept ancient beliefs without questioning, even if we desperately want to. How do we read the story of Adam and Eve in the face of evolutionary science? How do we read the book of Genesis alongside with a modern cosmology textbook? How do we become modern, science-minded people without losing our faith? Ideas like this have always been exciting to me. And about a decade ago, I explored some of them in a novel I wrote called The Da Vinci Code. In that novel, fictional characters debated a very simple question. What would it mean for Christianity if Christ were not literally the Son of God, if he were more like us, less way up there and more right down here? Well, I can tell you not everyone thought this was a good question to be asking. <laughs> uh, about a year after The Da Vinci Code was published, a priest walked up to me on the streets of Boston and he proclaimed in a very loud voice, Mr. Brown, I didn't like your novel one bit. Before I could figure out how to respond, this priest broke into a big smile and he added, but I just had to come over here and thank you. Every Wednesday night for the past 10 years, I've held Bible study in my office and every Wednesday night I've had the same eight people show up. Last month, I printed the usual notice in our church bulletin, reminding people of Bible study and telling them that this week we'd be talking about the Da Vinci Code. And guess what? I had hundreds of people show up for Bible study. Uh, <laughs> they had to move the meeting out into the church to fit them all. Uh, and he said, I've been trying to get people interested in this stuff for years. Talking about a novel isn't how I imagined doing it, but I am very grateful that the dialogue is finally happening. I believe it is our duty as reflective people to spark dialogue. And this is one of the primary reasons I write. Uh, writing, however, can be a very isolating pursuit. It is challenging and sometimes a very lonely way to spend your life. Uh, I'm guessing we probably have some writers here tonight. I, I can't really see you in the lights, but I'm, I'm imagining that you look uh, tormented and, and depressed. Um, <laughs> well, we'll have a group hug afterward or something. It, it's going to be all right. Um, on the process of writing, George Orwell said, writing a book is an exhausting struggle, like a long bout of some painful illness. Another famous author, when asked if he enjoyed being a writer, cleverly answered, I enjoy having written. Uh, Franz Kafka was a bit more direct and said, writing is utter solitude, the descent into the cold abyss of oneself. Uh, in any case, you get the idea. Writing is not the most fun you've ever had. Uh, it is solitary, it's schizophrenic, 
It's filled with demons and doubts, accompanied by the incessant voices of, of imaginary characters talking, uh, talking in your head 24 hours a day. And, and oftentimes they're drowning out the real people in your life, which, which I hear can be a little bit annoying. Um, <laughs> writers become very strange people when they write, and in light of that I would like to share the single truest statement I've ever heard about writers. There could be only one existence more miserable than being a writer, and that is being the spouse of a writer. Um, my wife does it so gracefully. Blythe, I, you're here tonight. I'd like to stand up for a second. Let me say thank you. Blythe, in addition to being my number one researcher and first pass editor, is a perpetually grounding force in my life. In Blythe's world, the New York Times bestseller list has no relevance whatsoever to who takes out the trash or who empties the dishwasher. Um, at the height of Da Vinci Code's popularity, a major news magazine ran the cover story, Does Christianity Have any Anything to Fear from Dan Brown? I, you know, feeling quite influential, put the magazine on Blythe's desk so she could see just how important a man she had married. Uh, later that day, the magazine was back on my desk with one passage highlighted. It was a quote from a prominent British priest who responded to the question on the cover with the following statement. Christian theology has survived the writings of Galileo and the writings of Darwin. Surely it will survive the writings of some novelist from New Hampshire. <laughs> so. A lot of people ask me about the process of turning books into movies, and I thought I'd talk about that for just a moment. Uh, at first, I wasn't even convinced I wanted to make a movie of The Da Vinci Code. Uh, for me, the magic of a book lies in its ability to be different things to different people. For example, when children first began reading Harry Potter, every single child created in his or her mind a unique mental image of Harry and all of the magical locations. However, as soon as the movie came out, every single reader from that moment on now pictured Harry in the exact same way as the actor. The characters that children had once imagined in countless different ways now took a single form. To borrow an analogy from quantum physics, when a book is turned into a movie, the quantum wave collapses and all possibilities cease to exist except one. And so with respect to the Da Vinci Code, I thought maybe I'd wait until I finished the Robert Langdon series, let the books be read for a number of years, and then make them into movies. <clears throat> It was during this period of uncertainty that I received a fax at home from a very famous movie producer, not Ron Howard, a different one. And this clever fax began in this way. Mr. Brown, there are moviegoers all over the world who either can't read or don't read. And by not making the Da Vinci Code movie, you are depriving millions of people of their God-given right to participate in this critical touchstone of human culture. That was just the beginning. Now look, I'm not usually a vain person, but by the end of this fax, I was nodding enthusiastically, saying, yes, for the good of mankind, we must make the Da Vinci Code movie. Uh, eventually, it was Columbia Pictures uh, that made the movie with Ron Howard and Tom Hanks. When I first learned that the budget for the movie was upwards of $150 million, I asked Ron Howard, Ron, how do you spend $150 million on a movie? A couple, uh, a couple months later, Standing in California in a life-size replica of Rome's Pantheon, I quietly asked Ron, hey, look, are you going to be able to make this for only $150 million? <laughs> and to answer that question uh, and a bunch of others, the studio assembled a book called The Making of the Da Vinci Code, and they asked me to write the foreword, which I did. I wrote about the thing that struck me most about the book-to-movie adaptation process, and that is that while they're both, they both have the same goal, they both want to tell a story, Movie making and book writing are polar opposite processes. So I'm just going to read you a, a, a paragraph from that forward. Writing a novel is a calm craft. It is embarked upon in solitude, often in one's pajamas before a crackling fire in the wee, or, wee hours of the morning. Novels materialize at their own pace, often glacially slow ones, and yet the novelist never checks his watch. He has no studio meetings, no conference calls with collaborators, and certainly no throngs of fans clamoring behind barricades to witness the magic of his process. The novelist writes whenever he wishes and wherever he wishes, unfettered by the whims of anyone other than his own muse. 
He never worries if his characters will arrive to work on time or if they'll give a good performance. He bounces freely between points of view and moves in and out of his characters' thoughts and mounts massive historical battles at no expense. A novelist who wishes to set a scene inside the Louvre Museum need not negotiate with the French cultural minister, nor must he gain the consent of the Italian police should he wish to send his protagonist on a car chase through Rome. A novelist never waits for proper sunlight or for traffic or for a writing permit. Don't get me wrong, writing novels is not easy. That novels get written is impressive, but that movies get made is miraculous. Uh, Blythe and I have never forgotten that first night of filming on the set for The Da Vinci Code. We arrived uh, to, the, to the Paris movie set, which in this case was a little museum called the Louvre. Uh, as we approached this museum, uh, traffic had been stopped for four blocks in all directions. There were police everywhere. Place Napoleon looked like some sort of Renaissance, Renaissance trailer park. It was just, uh, there must have been a hundred trailers for, for, the, for the actors and production staff and, and chefs and electricians. And our driver, a, a Frenchman named Guy, drove us into this chaos uh, you know, that, that, that we had essentially created. Uh, he looked back and he said in somber French, the pen is mightier than the sword. Uh, to be honest here, my French isn't that good. I have no idea what he said. Um, I, I think the actual translation was closer to you know, call my cell phone when you and your wife want to go home. Um, but he should have said the other thing. Uh, the novel takes place at night when the Louvre is closed, and so we filmed at night when the Louvre was closed. We would arrive at the museum at about 9 p.m., begin shooting at around midnight, and pack up at about 5 a.m. And it was that first night at 3 o'clock in the morning while wandering the deserted museum between takes that I found myself standing all alone before the Mona Lisa, that quietly smiling face that had started this whole thing. And as if this moment in itself were not enough of a life moment, uh, when I looked out into the Grand Gallery, I saw a pale figure scurrying past, an albino monk. Uh, needless to say, a pretty strange feeling. A few years earlier, I typed this scene uh, in, in Rye Beach, New Hampshire, and uh, later I'm, I'm standing in Paris, standing in the middle of this scene in real life. Um, I'm going to add just a little anecdote here because I see that my dear friend Robert Kraft is here. Robert, you came and visited us on the movie set, and I, I've got to tell you this. I mean. Robert, I'm sure many of you know, is, uh, is the owner of, a, of the finest professional football team in America, of course, the New England Patriots. And Robert was on the movie set watching. Now, you, I mean, this man lives a pretty exciting life, okay? His, his idea of entertainment is, you know, watching football. So we're sitting in the Louvre, and Tom Hanks and Jean Renault are walking back and forth. Uh, you know, Ron Howard had given them beautiful seats out here. And they're walking back and forth, delivering the same line over and over. We're shooting it from above, from below, from all the sides. After about an hour of this going back and forth, he sort of looked over his shoulder and he said, movie making isn't really a spectator sport, is it? <laughs> so with that, he hopped on his plane and went home. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, while we were filming in Scotland, we had some visitors to the movie set, including my parents, which, to be honest, made me really nervous. Uh, I was afraid my mom would flip out when she met Tom Hanks. Uh, she did not, actually. We had a lovely conversation. Uh, I was actually more afraid that my dad was going to get behind the camera with Ron Howard and start suggesting different angles. You know, more. Um, actually, they were very well behaved. Uh, one night, however, we were working, and I overheard my mom talking to one of the production assistants, and my mom said something that I must admit I never thought I would hear her say. She sighed heavily, and she said, do I really need to move? I'm quite comfortable sitting here on Bishop Aringarosa. <laughs> so I, somewhat alarmed, hurried over and re was relieved to find that my mother was not actually sitting on the man, Bishop Aringarosa, but rather on a cast chair that had Bishop Aringarosa written on the back. Um, her unlikely comment, though, became the first of many strange things that I overheard during production. And so I kept a little list, which I thought I would share with you tonight. These fall under the category of things you never thought you'd hear. One day on the set, my dad walked happily over to me and he said, I just met the Pope. Nice guy. He's a Sox fan. <laughs> things you never thought you'd hear. Overheard one night in the Louvre, move the corpse three feet to the left, just don't get any blood on the Caravaggio. 
And one of my favorites, could someone please get Mary Magdalene a Diet Coke? So. <laughs> yeah. We were, uh, we filmed in Edinburgh and uh, I've, I've got one last thing that I never thought I'd hear. Mr. Hanks, good news, Lady Rosalind called and you can use the bathroom in her castle. <laughs> Again, things you never thought you'd hear. Uh, when we finished filming, Columbia Pictures threw an after party at the Balmoral Hotel in Edinburgh, and the men were all in film informed that we were going to be wearing formal kilts, which I had never done. So before the party, I'm in a hotel room with Tom Hanks and Ron Howard and a few other people trying to figure out how to wear a kilt. And I was having some trouble, and Tom very kindly came over and helped me out. And at that moment, Ron asked me, Dan, when you started writing The Da Vinci Code, did you ever imagine that you'd be in a hotel room in Scotland with Tom Hanks pinning your skirt? <laughs> um, I sheepishly admitted that this exact scenario had been my life dream, and that uh, writing The Da Vinci Code was the only way I could figure out how to make it happen. Before I take a few questions here, I should probably say at least something about a book that came out yesterday called Inferno. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I should also actually probably take a second to thank a woman I have never met, never spoken to, and yet someone I love deeply, uh, the legendary critic for the New York Times, Janet Maslin. Uh, Janet, wherever you are, uh, thank you for understanding what it is I try so hard to do. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I've known for at least a decade that I would write uh, about Dante's vision of the underworld. One of the byproducts of researching Angels and Demons and the Da Vinci Code was becoming immersed in church history and realizing how profoundly Dante influenced the modern Christian perception of hell. The notion of hell certainly existed long before Dante, and yet really only in vague terms. The Bible talks about hell um, as in kind of ethereal terms, as a land of unquenchable fire. Uh, Greek mythology was slightly more specific. There was a little bit more of a landscape, a few monsters. But it really was not until Dante's Inferno that we had this vivid, codified, uh, terrifying vision of hell. And uh, Dante's portrayal of you know, the world that awaited sinners uh, captivated the populace. Uh, the Divine Comedy was a, was a thriller of its day, and as you can imagine, there was a quick uptick in church attendance uh, when, when Inferno was read. Over the past 700 years, Dante Alighieri has had staggering influence on culture and the arts. With the exception of the Bible, no book in history has inspired more art, music, and literature than the Divine Comedy. Dante's epic poem has sparked works by some of history's greatest luminaries, Longfellow, Chaucer, Borges, Tchaikovsky, Liszt, Monteverdi, Michelangelo, Blake, Dali, and, and in modern days, a, a whole host of video game designers. Uh, as I found out trying to research the book online, I kept getting these uh, video games. Of the, seven, of the seven deadly sins, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride, I'm going to read those again, that, that was fun. Lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride, Dante considered the most serious to be pride. He was probably influenced by the Bible, which warns pride goeth before total destruction, or by Greek mythology, which continually represents hubris, or pride, as the downfall of the archetypal hero. But in either case, Dante's distaste for pride is a recurring theme in the Divine Comedy, where he makes the point that no man is more prideful than he who considers himself above the problems of the world. He who ignores danger or injustice just because it does not affect him directly. In other words, in a world facing problems, the greatest sin of all is to do nothing. In keeping with that theme, on the very first page of my novel, you will find a famous Dante-inspired quote which reads, The darkest places in hell are reserved for those who maintain their neutrality in times of moral crisis. It's a bit tricky to talk about a novel that not many people have read. Um, I don't want to ruin any of the plot twists. So in the spirit of codes and puzzles, uh, I'm going to do something a little strange here. I've decided to choose three unusual words from the book and share only those with you. 
uh, elaborating a little bit on each and letting you start to connect the dots and get a sense of some of the themes of the book. The first word is an Italian word, contrapasso. Uh, it literally means to suffer the opposite. In Dante's vision of hell, contrapasso essentially means that the punishment you suffer in hell is the opposite of the sin you committed on earth. Uh, for example, in Dante's hell, fortune tellers, those who have sinned against God by seeing the future, uh, they have their heads affixed to their bodies backwards, such that they can only see in reverse. Flatterers, those who constantly deluge other with others with what we would politely call BS, in hell find themselves literally submerged in BS. Um, and adulterers, well, <laughs> in Dante's Inferno, if you are unfaithful to your spouse, you and your adulterous lover will have your private parts physically fused to one another, doomed to remain in this awkward position for all eternity while being tossed around by a never-ending squall. So, so behave. Um, I'll admit, from the picture of hell painted by Dante, the Divine Comedy does not sound much like a comedy. Uh, of course, we all know that in Dante's time, commedia did not necessarily mean humorous or light. It, it was a rather a genre of literature, written for the masses, usually written in the local vernacular rather than in Latin. Dante composed the Divine Comedy primarily in his local Tuscan dialect, and in doing so, he helped establish the language we now know as modern Italian. The genre commedia, in addition to being written for the masses, has another defining characteristic. Traditionally, the protagonist of a comedy finishes his adventure in a better situation than he started. And in the case of the Divine Comedy, Dante's descent into hell is just the first of three canticles. After escaping Inferno, Dante proceeds to Purgatory, where he learns about purging sin. And eventually, he reaches Paradise, where he meets God and becomes enlightened. So at the end of the day, the poem has a happy ending. I focus primarily on Inferno because it's the most vivid, the most influential, and because it's such a natural fit for a thriller writer and, and of course, for the skill set of Robert Langdon. The second word I want to share with you <coughs> is transhumanism. Um, actually, it's a, I can also share it as a symbol. I guess we, I don't know if we have the symbol behind me, but the symbol for transhumanism is the letter H with a plus sign, H plus, humanism plus. Some scholars have called transhumanism the most daring, courageous, and imaginative aspiration of humanity. Others have called it the world's most dangerous idea. Transhumanism is an intellectual movement that explores the science and ethics of using advanced technologies like genetic engineering to improve the human physiology. We now have the technology to manifest permanent genetic changes in our species creating descendants of increased dexterity, stamina, strength, and even intelligence. The question is, should we? Is the next stage of human development that we assist our own evolutionary process, that we begin engineering ourselves? Uh, this is the debate at the core of the transhumanist philosophy. Currently, through in vitro fertilization prenatal drugs, parents are able to select for a certain gender or select uh, for a certain hair color or eye color or they can select against a predisposition toward a certain disease. Uh, this kind of selection process is obviously something quite different than Darwin's natural selection. According to some geneticists, the danger of playing God is that our genome is a house of cards, and trying to alter a few human traits can cause hundreds of other traits to shift unexpectedly, possibly with catastrophic effect. Whichever side of the transhumanist debate you fall on, one thing is for certain. In the coming years, we will all face profound ethical decisions about emerging technologies and what it means to be human. And finally, speaking of the future, here's a third and final word that I wanted to share from the novel, Malthusian. Uh, many of you probably recognize the word as it relates to Thomas Malthus, the 19th century British scholar and cleric, best known for his writings on human population growth. In the early 1800s, Malthus strongly warned that the human race, at its current growth rate, would one day fill up the planet and our species would totally collapse. This prediction became known as the Malthusian catastrophe. Eerily, eerily some of his dire prediction about mankind's future landscape looked strangely like certain parts of Dante's Inferno, where throngs of humanity writhe in hunger, violence, and sickness. 
The antagonist in this new novel is both a Dante fanatic and a believer in the inevitability of, of the Malthusian catastrophe. He sees Dante's grim vision of hell not as history, but as prophecy. And before you say he's crazy, let me offer you one sobering statistic. If you know someone who is 85 years old, you know someone who was born into a world population that was one-third what it is today. In 85 years, the population of this planet has tripled. We add 200,000 new people every single day. Futurists do not consider overpopulation one of the issues of the future. They consider it the issue of the future. And so on that happy note, uh, <laughs> sorry, that was very grim. Um, to finish up the evening, uh, we thought it would be fun, and by, by we, I mean my publisher thought it would be fun, uh, if I took some questions from the audience. Uh, I assumed that meant you, uh, but I was informed last week that I would be taking questions from my virtual audience, questions submitted via Facebook, Twitter, websites, on and on. Uh, so I told my publisher, look, I prefer to take questions from the live audience, and I was informed that we had al already promised some 7 million people that they could submit questions which I would answer live on stage tonight. Fortunately, there were only 13,353 submissions. So I'm only going to answer half of them, so we're fine. So, do they serve breakfast here? Uh, when the list was sent to me, I was asked to choose seven questions. One for each of the deadly sins, I figured. And so as I began to skim the list and try to figure out which, one, which ones I would choose to answer, I realized that this was actually a whole lot easier than asking the audience. You know, this way I could just skip over any prickly questions and answer the ones I wanted to answer. So as I perused the list, the first question that caught my eye was sent in on Facebook from Irene M. Pierce on April 22nd at 1.43 p.m. And it reads, Mr. Brown, why are you so awesome? <laughs> So for the next 40 minutes or so, I, I thought I'd just focus on this question a little bit. Okay, at some point I realized that this selection method wasn't totally fair. Uh, I actually needed to throw in a few qu harder questions, you know, questions that I actually preferred not to answer, and there were plenty of those as well. Here's a question from Shelby in Oklahoma. Dear Mr. Brown, some critics have said some not very nice things about you. How does that make you feel? Well, Shelby. What a nice question, thank you for asking. Uh, look, at some point, all creative people are taught to say, I don't notice a bad review, I'm immune to my critics. Uh, guess what, it's not true. Um, of course it hurts when you get a bad review. We all wish that everybody loved everything that we do. Uh, but that is just not how it works. Um, I've learned along the way that universal appreciation, universal admiration is a very unrealistic goal. Uh, when you're in a creative field, be that an author, a musician, a painter, or even a chef, all you have to guide you is your own taste. Uh, and you use that taste to create a book, a symphony, a painting, or, or a souffle that you like, that suits your taste, that suits your palate. And then you pray that other people share your taste. Some will, they'll be your fans, some won't, they'll be your critics. But either way, putting too much stock in either opinion is a lose-lose proposition, proposition for your creative work. If you believe those who say you're great, you get lazy and your work suffers. If you believe those who say you're lousy, you become apprehensive and your work suffers. So I've just learned to put on the blinders, write the book that I would want to read, and hope that people like the same kind of books that I do. Here's a question from Dave in New York City. I don't know if Dave is here tonight, but he writes in, is it true that Pope Ratzinger resigned so suddenly because he got an advanced copy of your novel and decided to skip town? <laughs> Dave, truth be told, the Vatican is hardly mentioned in this novel, but I like the way you think. <laughs> uh, here's a question from Carietta in California. And actually, when I saw the beginning of this question, I thought I was going to love it. It begins, Dear Mr. Brown, I loved, loved, loved the Da Vinci Code. Then I read the next words, however. 
However, my priest showed me passages in the Bible that contradict your story. In the end, your book did not change my ideas about Jesus or shape my faith. Would you consider your novel a success or a failure in my case? Actually, pretty interesting question. Uh, to answer it, I'd like to borrow the very eloquent words of one of my favorite writers, Malcolm Gladwell, who said, Good writing does not succeed or fail on the strength of, strength of its ability to persuade. It succeeds or fails on the strength of its ability to engage you, to make you think, and to give you a glimpse into someone else's head. So Marietta, I'm hoping that the Da Vinci Code did just that, that engaged you and made you think. Uh, this was my hope in writing the novel. Uh, I should add that when an author writes a book whose underlying premise is that um, history as we know it is not necessarily accurate, uh, that author had better anticipate and on some level welcome that there will be people who stand up and shout, wait a minute, what you say in your book doesn't match what it says in my book. Uh, that is precisely the point. Without debate, without disagreement, there is no dialogue. The next question. This, I suspect, was sent in from uh, one of my childhood teachers writing under a pseudonym. He writes, Mr. Brown, in your novels you name a lot of characters after your boyhood teachers and then you kill them. Why? <laughs> uh, before, I, I should say that we have, a, we have a contingent here from my high school alma mater, Philip Sexeter. Where are you folks? <laughs> Welcome. We also have a contingent from my college alma mater, Amherst College. I'm guessing right here. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, I thought this was a good question to answer about killing my childhood teachers, but I actually, I spotted tonight a couple of my childhood teachers in the audience. It was supposed to be alumni, not faculty, but that's okay. Um, suddenly this has all become very awkward, but I'm going to answer the question anyway. Uh, in my defense for killing off my childhood teachers, Dante in the Divine Comedy names all of his old political ri rivals, places them in hell where they must adore, endure brutal tortures for all time. So my quickly killing off my teachers is actually very compassionate in comparison. <laughs> um, also in defense, I would like to tell all of these teachers that I killed exactly what my mother used to tell me when I got teased on the playground. Danny, they only tease you because they like you. <laughs> of course, now I know that was a total lie. Uh, <laughs> But with respect to these teachers, it's the absolute truth. All of the childhood teachers that I put in the books received these cameo parts because I had great respect for them. I consider it immaterial that I later buried them alive or burned them at the stake. <laughs> uh, my 12th grade Italian teacher in Exeter is a wonderful man named Signore Aldo Baggio. Uh, Mr. Baggio was thrilled when he learned that in my novel Angels and Demons he had become Cardinal Baggio, first in line for the papacy. He was distinctly less thrilled when he read the novel and learned that a maniacal assassin had drowned him in the fountain of the Four Rivers. Uh, I later felt very badly about this. Um, and in the movie version of Angels and Demons, Tom Hanks gave Cardinal Baja mouth to mouth and saved him. And it was, uh, he lived. It was a miracle. At, <laughs> at Amherst College, one of my favorite teachers was my geology professor, Gerald Brophy. And in my novel, Deception Point, I made Mr. Brophy a respected glaciologist uh, doing research in the North Pole. And then I threw him out of a helicopter to his death into an ice chasm. <laughs> I will say, Professor Brophy has not spoken to me since. Uh, next question. Dear Dan, your previous novel, The Lost Symbol, was about Masonic mysticism and has the catchphrase, all will be revealed at the 33rd degree. You chose to publish that book on 9-15-09 and later revealed that those three numbers, 9-15 and 9, all added up to 33, the sacred number of the Masons. I could not help but notice that Inferno's publication date, 5-14-13, also has some very strange properties. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, I calculated the odds of this happening by chance at about 1 in 2.3 billion, so don't pretend you don't know. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that's a question. It feels a little bit more like an accusation. Uh, so I prepared a statement. <clears throat> On advice from counsel, I cannot confirm or deny that I was shocked to learn that this book's publication date, 5-14-13, when written backwards, 
reveals the first five digits of the mathematical constant pi, 3.1415. Nor can I confirm or deny that seven codes carefully hidden on the book jacket reveal any life-altering secrets or serve any purpose other than the amusement of myself and my editor. So. Uh, and a final question here from Raniel Kagalingen in Manila. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Raniel. Dear Mr. Brown, you can choose any interesting topic in the world. Why would you choose to read a 14,000 line poem in medieval Italian? Um, I will tell you halfway through this novel, I was asking myself that <laughs> exact same question. Uh, I've written frequently about the fine arts, but I had never written about the literary arts, and so Dante um, really spoke to me as, as something new. But in many ways, uh, Dante felt like familiar ground for, for Langman, felt like good territory. The Divine Comedy, like the Mona Lisa, is one of those rare human achievements that transcends its moment in history and has become an enduring cultural touchstone. Uh, for me, it was really an impossible uh, topic to resist. And I'm not alone here. There are scholars who have dedicated their entire careers to studying the Divine Comedy. My hope for readers of this novel is that they are inspired to rediscover Dante or perhaps discover him for the first time. And as they do, that they appreciate Dante's genius, his lasting influence, and also that they take time to enjoy some of the incredible artwork that Dante has inspired over the last 700 years. And if that happens for even a handful of readers, uh, I will feel like my three years in hell uh, was, was worth it. So I'm going to finish talking here in about 30 seconds, but I want to get serious again for just a moment and close with one brief thought. This is something I've stated publicly before, but I'm passionate about it and I feel it bears repeating. There is nothing in our DNA that predetermines our beliefs. We are not born into this world believing that a particular God is the true God. We are born into a culture. We worship the gods of our parents. If all of us in this room had been born in the mountains of Tibet, most of us would be Buddhists. And we would hold on to that Buddhist philosophy with the same passion that we now hold on to our current beliefs. We worship the gods of our parents. It is truly that simple. The world is getting smaller every day, and now more than ever, there is enormous danger in believing that we are infallible, that our version of the truth is absolute, and that everyone who does not think like we do is wrong and therefore an enemy. For our own survival, it is critical that we live with open minds, that we educate ourselves, that we ask difficult questions, and above all, that we engage in dialogue, especially with those whose ideas are not our own. And so in the name of dialogue and sharing ideas, I just want to acknowledge that tonight, what has brought, to, brought us together in this space is quite simply books. Those magical artifacts that share ideas across borders, across cultures, across languages, and most importantly, across time. So for all of you in the audience who write books, who publish books, who sell books, and above all, who read books, I thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night.